The following was recorded in front of a live studio audience at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. This is the United Podcast Network. Welcome to the Writer's Block Podcast NH. This is a podcast designed by writers for writers on the journey to being published. Joined Mandra Miss Cornet. It was so healthy and nutritious. Deborah Monk. Can we open each podcast with a dance number? Shelly Devlin. It was so full of inspiration and sparkles. Every Tuesday morning live on YouTube. And make sure you subscribe to catch the podcast anytime on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Podbean, Spotify, or your favorite podcast catcher. It's time to be inspired, feel empowered, and be well with the Writer's Block Podcast NH. And welcome to the Writer's Block Podcast. I'm Mandra Biscornay, and I think everyone has a story to tell. What's yours? I'm Deborah Monk, empowering <clears throat> you to find your creative voice. And I'm Shelley Devlin, inspiring you to find your why. Last week on the Writer's Block, we talked about grounding. We talked about pulling your reader into that imaginary world using who, where, and what. Today, we're going to continue on that theme of grounding and share some of um, our own writing examples to teach you how to ground the reader into your world. So hopefully you get a little before and after on how to make it better. Yes, and, and how, how nice it is of us to share our ugly, our before. <laughs> Yes, there's a little vulnerability there. We're putting out some stuff that might not be so great in On hopes purpose, to yes. make it better. Yes. And that's something writers need to do. You have to be able to take that. And you have to realize the book that you read is not what they started with. So this is us showing you what we look like before we're all made up and pretty. <laughs> right. Yeah. And edited. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So let's start with something... Um, a sample, Debbie, that you have for us. Okay. So I went back in and pil- pulled out just the beginning of a story that I haven't written yet, but I wrote the first scene. So here's my first take. Some people say life turns on a dime. Angel Figueroa believes life turns on a beautiful woman, and in his experience, never for the better. She cut through the crowd of the Miami nightclub, her hips undulating like a snake in the Garden of Edel- Evil. Her white dress kissed the top of her knees, and the blousy top covered more than it revealed. From the front, she looked like an angel, an angel that had fallen all the way into the bowels of hell. But when she walked past, the back hung loosely from a single tie at her neck. The dress draped and swayed, opening and closing, offering glimpses of sun-kissed skin. If the devil had angels, this is what she would look like. The women who wore, the women who were here every night, who wore too much makeup and offered sin, belonged. She didn't. She offered something much worse than sin. She offered hope. All right. So. Then, and and this was, you know, just just rough, but when I went back and I thought about our show, about the who, what, where, and I thought, okay, there are a lot of angels in that. And I start with an angel Figaro, a character. Right. We don't know if that's a man or a woman. And then I use angels multiple times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, so here's my attempt to fix it. Some people say life turns on a dime. Jason believed life turns on beautiful women and in his experience, never for the better. Sitting in the bowels of hell, the only bar in Miami that would still serve him, he watched her cut through the crowd, her hips undulating like a snake in the garden of evil. From the front, her dress covered more than it revealed, but when she walked past, his hand itched to pull on the single tie around her neck holding the dress up. The women who were here every night wore too much makeup and too little clothes offered sin. This woman offered something much worse. She offered hope. And this devil's angels was headed straight toward him. Ooh. See, I I was con- more clear, way more clear, yes. way more clear. In the first one, I was confused about the angel yep. Figueroa character. Was that the woman in the white dress, right. or was that the person sitting? And the other thing I was confused about, I even though you said Miami there, yep. On my first read, for some reason, I thought we were in like Las Vegas. Like I had the Las Vegas Strip in in mind. And when I read the second paragraph, I immediately knew, oh, no, we're in Miami, right. Florida. Like, okay, this makes more sense. I know what bar we're in. Um, right. So instead of saying she was an angel who had fallen into the bowels of hell, I named the nightclub you named the, the night bowels cl- of hell. Right. Yes. So it's yes. a lot more clear. Yes. Oh, okay. That's Where a nightclub. Yes. That's mm-hmm. not just a mm-hmm. phrase. Right. We know who. Yes. Where, where Jason. It's Jason. It's a man. And, yep. and he's seeing her. Uh-huh. She's not 
Angel Figueroa. And in the first one, I couldn't hear anything. And the second one, I heard Cuban music playing. Did you? <gasps> yeah. Because you were more set in a I Miami just nightclub. Just yeah. right in there. Right. Mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. totally missed the Miami thing in the, fir- in the first one for some reason. But it's just way more clear here. Right. Sitting in the bowels of hell, the, the only, only bar, bar in Miami, Miami that would still serve him. It's almost right. like that slows you down yep. to pay attention the only bar that would still serve him, you know, now you know it's what the name is and where it is. Well, and the other thing, which I don't know if you'll notice, which I, I did on purpose, <clears throat> was I ground you more in his perspective on this one. Yeah. Yes. By saying things like you're, he's in the bar, the only one that would still serve him. I did a lot less description of her dress. And I made it right. that instead of just saying he sees the tie that holds the dress up, his hand itched to pull on the single tie. So instead of making it so much about this woman that I could see cutting through the club, which is, of course, what I was seeing when I was visualizing this scene, I put you more in his head of what he wants to do or what it makes him feel rather than just seeing. So I took out a lot of less. So you added a lot of why in this one. Well, I think I. Oh, I guess I. I, You were kind of did to help us more about him. Yes. Right. But ironically is less words. Yes. Your mm-hmm. better draft is actually less yes. words. So the choice of where you put your who, where, and what in better words and better sentences. And I think the important thing is that you, if you let yourself do it that first time, you know, that bowels of hell, I think, name, I, I like wouldn't that, have yeah. thought of. If I had said, oh, what should I name the night? If I had been thinking, You're, what should I name the Miami nightclub? I wouldn't have, you know, I don't know what I would have come up with. But because I had just written what I wanted to write, mm-hmm. you could pull that I, out. I thought, oh, that's a great line. How can I use that? but not so randomly. So um, one of uh, my editor will say, give yourself the permission to write yes. a shitty first draft yes. because it actually turns into an outline for your better second draft. Right. Because then you can pick and choose. And and even, yeah. And, and it's this way is, more clear who the who is. Right. For sure. And and again, like for me, the where. Right. <clears throat> right. And, and it was because of last week's show you know, I, I would have edited this. Clearly, this was just a first draft in, in a file in my filing cabinet. And I would have edited, but I'm, I I wouldn't have quite... Like, this really gave me a way to edit it. Sure. You edited it with grounding in mind. mind. Yes. Versus just sort of reading through and because trying we, to a lot of times figure out what's better. We don't know how to make it better. Right. And, and, be, and we like, end up making it worse. <laughs> right. <laughs> And that's why having a group... <laughs> like, and, no, no, Mandra, go back to that other one. <laughs> and a show like ours can help you. That's right. All right. right. So, Mandra, do you have one for I us? I do have one. Um, this is from my memoir, and it is uh, pre-Brad getting his heart transplant, but sort of things slowly ramping up around the um, February of that year. So, here we go. On his birthday, Brad went to our community hospital, Lowell General, for blood work. Then we started moving things out of the kitchen and family room. I had started packing up over the weekend, but there was still much to do to, pre- to prepare for the renovations and demolition and the demolition that was starting tomorrow. Brad helped as much as he could, but he could not carry boxes. He had become so weak. So I'll stop okay, there. So I'm in two places. I'm yes. at the hospital and I'm at home. Right. So I'm confused right off the bat. Right. Yep. In two sentences, so you're in two different the places. The other thing, too, is finding your why <clears throat> is why that paragraph. Because is it about the renovation or is it about Brad becoming weak and not able to help with that a good life point. moment that's happening? It's really about him, yes? Um, or is it about the renovation? <laughs> I mean, the book's about him. <laughs> well... Well, the renovation plays into it, though, in the next couple of paragraphs. But is it t- above? No, it's, it's about more Brad? his weakness and not able right. so to help. But then, what's that? Or about is him. it? Or is or it? Or is it? See, I would. I would. That. What would you say? Well, because you sent this to us ahead of time, and so I'm going to keep reading because I don't want to give away. Oh, okay. We took a break to finalize some paint colors for the cabinets when Brad got a call from Heather at Children's Children's Hospital. She said that his BUN, a measure of his kidney function number, was high, and they wanted Brad to go inpatient tomorrow. She also told him the doctors were trying to schedule a second liver biopsy for the beginning of the week. Keep going. Keep going. Okay. Now the pressure was on. We had even less time to decide on things with Brad going inpatient. Brad and I sat at the dining room table, poring over cabinet colors, glazes, wall colors, and countertops. Brad had a great eye for complementing colors, 
and was choosing nice warm tones. That was fun, sitting next to him, seeing how colors would look together. For a little while, we were like any other couple, just flipping through interior design options, trying to trying out different combinations, and chatting as, as if the new wall color was our biggest worry in life. I love the last line. I know, but see, that's why I think that's what, the, that's what this whole thing is about. Yes. I think that this is about Mandra's feeling of she had that one little moment of life is normal. And how she was, she was, you know, cherishing that moment Mm -hmm. because the rest of her life isn't that. So, and, and I'm not speaking for Mandra, but if, if that is what it's about, everything that came before, which is important for building this up, but, and she can keep that surprise. Like the way she put that at the end, it's kind of like, whoa, that's a zinger, Mm -hmm. which is a great thing to do, but she didn't set us up for that. No. And some of it is unneeded. Like the fact that there's going to be a second liver biopsy at the beginning of the week, who cares? The point is that we thought we had a little bit more time and now we just got this phone call that he has to go into the hospital tomorrow. And so now the pressure's on. And none of that's in there. Correct. Right. (laughs) (laughs) And and everybody has their own process and this is Mandra's process. So it's, we're not, it's not like Mandra's process is to put down the facts Yes. Mm-hmm. And then she tells us, and then we say, okay, that's what you're trying to tell us. And then I have to go back. And then you have to go back and thread a throat. Now, right. here's a way you could do it. One thing is you don't have any dialogue in here. Mm-hmm. So dialogue would really help. Instead of telling us, yes. Brad had a great eye for complimentary colors and <laughs> choosing nice warm tones. <laughs> Brad could say, I have a great eye for colors. <laughs> You'd be like, well, I'm the tones. graphic designer, so I'm pecking the colors. <laughs> See, that, that's that, what he should that's say. Yes, that's because what he got to have his personality it in there. It puts right. his personality in. It tells us who he is and what he does. And it, right? and it puts at risk what he might not be able to do. Um, you know, what? I mean, I, I'll go dark and deep, but what would her uh-huh. house look like if this didn't go well? You know, would she end up in a monotone house because she has no taste? <laughs> Oh my God. Everything would be white. (laughs) Right. See, (laughs) and maybe say, you know, I don't know if that occurred to you in that moment, but you know, you need, you know, you need Brad in your life to keep it warm. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, these are things. And so, so uh, dialogue would be a really good way. Um, Setting us in your home. Right. Because when we Skype, we mm-hmm. found out that Mandra, before we had been to her house, we found out she had that, uh, to me, it looks very French, the mm. red. It's French toile wallpaper. French toile yeah. ra- wallpaper. Yeah. Gorgeous. I never would have guessed that. So when she no. showed up on Skype, I was like, where is she? That can't be her house. That doesn't look <laughs> like her. But see, that's a part of her that we hadn't seen at that point. Yes. Right. And so, even like the table, like it's yes. a big old oak. Mm-hmm. That It was then a big old oak table that had been in the family, you know, and just those details I think would make this. Right ground people more, keep them in rather than the, oh, he's got this appointment, he's got that appointment, some person called from the hospital. Right. You know. And so in a way, what this scene is, what you're telling us this scene was supposed to give was that sense of time is running out, which mm-hmm. is every action movie. Right. You know, oh, the bomb's counting down literally to tell you when the... So that's what this is supposed to be about, and and that's not in there at all. And just that little piece of like, even though we knew, we were we were pretending. This is mm-hmm. what couples do, right? They right. sit around, they pick out these colors. They don't go inpatient to children's and have a at whatever. 20, at whatever age you are, yeah. right. Yeah. So it was just that little piece of like normalcy that we were, I was hanging on to. And what's important about that little piece of normalcy is that the rest of your world isn't that. Right. Oh. I muted Ooh. myself. <laughs> well, that's something. <laughs> wow. wow. No, I'm not taking the mute Please, button home with me. can you bring that home? <laughs> Uh, that was good. What 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 is striking me as even more important than the work itself is having people who can read your work. So having a group of people that you can present your work to that have the understanding of the show not tell mentality mm-hmm. to be able to look at your writing because you you can read it a thousand times and you get brought back to that spot. Right. And she's brought back to the wood table with exactly. and the feeling of the pressure is on. Right. But you may miss the fact that your audience isn't getting that. Exactly. Right. And and it's really understanding that you're not just going to automatically know how to do this. I mean, I really, I literally have two books out and I sort of, there's a very big difference between knowing information and owning information. Mm-hmm. So in, when I teach mm-hmm. ballroom dancing, all my students understand the words that I say to them. They can repeat them back to me. They understand the heel of the foot and the ball of the foot and the toe of the foot. That doesn't mean they own it. That doesn't mean they can do it. Right. So here, what we're trying to show you is, as a group is that... You know, it, it, 
we're trying to actually show you how we do it. Right. Not just say the words, you need to ground your reader. That sounds wonderful. What does that sure. mean? Yeah. And I think bringing it back to what, what Jonathan said too, we trust each other. So I can hear you say, this could be better here. This is how you can do it and not feel like I hate you for correcting my work. Yeah. There's a level of trust mm -hmm. that we have in our group and that's what is, sometimes can be hard to find, but it's important or else you're not going to take that critique so well. You're not going to take that feedback. Um, like I don't get defensive. Right. You right. know, I can right. read this and people and can pipe in and, and part of that is just a comfort level with you guys. But I think writers have to get comfortable with hearing the feedback so that you can make it better. Um, and, and you have to that figure part out if can't you, be solitary. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And you have to figure out if you trust the person saying it too. Because mm -hmm. there are going to be times when you say things. Um, I had my critique group in, in um, Searching for Julia. No, in Well-Behaved Woman. They said the scene where she throws the glass against the, uh, against the wall, the mirror shatters. They, all three of them said, this is, you can't have that in there. I said, I, I need it. Yeah. So you have to you have to know when you can when to listen and when not to and when not mm -hmm. to. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you all for listening to our uh, Writer's Block podcast on grounding. You can check out the Writer's Block NH Facebook or the Writer's Block podcast on your favorite podcast catcher. If you'd like to hear this episode again or share it with a friend, you can head on over to the United Podcast Network TV. That's United Podcast Network TV. Thank you for listening, and we hope to inspire and empower you to tell your own story. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts, guests, or callers of this program do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe, the United Podcast Network, its partners or affiliates.